Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another broadcast uh, by Virus Phantom. My name is Semi Tarin. I'm a virologist who specializes in viruses and using viruses for gene and cell therapy. Today, I'll be talking to you about COVID-19 vaccines and mutations. And uh, this presentation is brought to you by the Turkish American Cultural Association of Washington. Uh, it is in collaboration with the Takawa Social Support Network. And uh, I would like to thank you for them for distributing this uh, worldwide to many sites. So now let's begin, my friends. Uh, all right, first of all, a big thank you to all of you for taking the time to joining in today. Uh, I will be introducing you to COVID-19, the virus itself, and to the concept of mutations. And I'll try to describe what that is all about. Um, I will, uh, the presentation will last about an hour, and then we will take time to answer some questions, which you can add on the chat uh, area over there. By the way, you can find me on social media under the moniker of Virus Phantom. I'm very active on Twitter and also on Instagram and YouTube. And I post both in English and in Turkish. And uh, the reason for that is I am actually a Turkish scientist born and raised in Turkey, but uh, now living in the US and working in the US. So I hope you find this presentation helpful. All right, folks. So if we were meeting uh, six months ago, this is a CNN headline from May uh, 4th, 2020. Uh, this would be a completely different story because we didn't even know if vaccines would be available or if they would even work. Uh, but now we're in a different date. Uh, this is December 8th, again from CNN. And here is an image of the first uh, British person to receive uh, the recently approved COVID-19 vaccine in England. So this is a big deal. And uh, this is something that all of us are celebrating, both in the field of science as well as uh, everywhere else. And when we look at the data, what we see from the Pfizer vaccine, which was made in collaboration with Pfizer, BioNTech, and Fosun Bio, uh, you can look at cumulative COVID-19 cases in the clinical trials over time. And when you compare the placebo group, which is in red, to the group that was vaccinated, which is in blue, you will see a difference in cumulative COVID-19 cases where uh, this vaccine is given uh, in two doses over 21 days uh, apart. And you see increases in COVID-19 in the placebo and not that type of an increase in the uh, vaccine arms. As you know, all clinical trials are done in both a placebo group and a vaccine group where the uh, participants are randomized and the studies are blinded, so the participants don't know what they're receiving. All right, uh, and uh, you may have seen headlines of these two scientists who are from BioNTech, uh, either in the upcoming issue of Time magazine and the cover of Time, as well as Der Spiegel. And these are actually uh, Turkish scientists who are uh, in Germany and also German citizens. Uh, Ur Shahin was born in uh, Turkey and then uh, immigrated to Germany. And Özlem Türeci was uh, born in Germany to Turkish parents. And of course, uh, since this is a presentation in collaboration with the Turkish American Cultural Association of Washington, and since I am also from Turkey, uh, this of course makes us Turkish immigrants proud. And not just Turkish immigrants, but all immigrants all over the world uh, who are working together, immigrant or not, with scientists coming together to overcome this pandemic. And when we look at the Moderna data, we see a similar trend, my friends. Uh, we see a trend where in the Moderna data as well, when we look at cumulative COVID-19 cases over time, we see an increase in COVID-19 cases in the placebo arm shown in blue, uh, but not that type of an increase in the vaccine arm. This is how you may have heard the numbers like 90% uh, efficacy or 95% efficacy. It's calculated from these values. In fact, so much so that whenever I look at a Google Maps, uh, whenever I see a road split like this, all I see is nothing but a placebo arm and a vaccine arm. These data are really impressive. In fact, uh, when you look at all the data, my friends, uh, percent efficacy of 90%, 95% is seriously very, very good. 
Uh, and of course, now we're just following the clinical trials to see if this holds up. Uh, just to make a comparison, uh, the most effective vaccine to date is for measles. And the measles vaccine is about 98% effective. Compare that with the seasonal flu vaccine, which can vary year to year. And it's uh, either uh, as low as 20% or it can be as high as 60%. So efficacy values of 90% and above is remarkable. All right, so uh, let's talk about the disease and the virus itself. So COVID-19 is the name of the disease and the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. SARS as in severe acute respiratory syndrome, CoV meaning coronavirus, and two meaning this is the second designated SARS virus. The first one was in 2002, uh, at the time simply known as SARS, uh, but now known as SARS-CoV-1. And as you may know, in 2012, there was another co serious coronavirus outbreak, but that was designated as MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And let's uh, go over briefly uh, for the next few minutes about what a virus is. This information is going to be important because often when people think of viruses, they think of them as pathogens. Here is one of my favorite paintings by Gabriel von Mox. I got to see this painting at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle, and it's a beautiful painting, and it's called The Anatomist, and it's showing an anatomist contemplating the death of a patient, and there are a lot of imagery here uh, of skulls and other things that designates how uh, physicians didn't really know how to handle uh, certain infectious diseases or other illnesses. Uh, now, viruses, we always think of them as pathogens, uh, of course, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. Here are two gentlemen who first described viruses as, in Latin, as a contagious fluid. And when you look on Wikipedia and you ask yourself, what are the deadliest infectious diseases? What you see is that the majority of the top of the list are viruses. I'm highlighting them here with yellow arrows. Uh, the deadliest virus of all, which also happens to be my favorite virus, is rabies. Uh, a lot of people forget this, but uh, thanks to vaccines, uh, as long as it's treated, rabies is not uh, deadly anymore. However, if left untreated, rabies fatality is almost about 100%. Uh, by the way, uh, if you are interested in learning more about rabies, I recommend this book uh, on the bottom right called Rabid. It's an excellent book about the rabies virus and the case histories and the culture of humans living with uh, viruses like rabies. And here's an electron microscope image of the rabies virus. Uh, smallpox is also on this list. And I'm highlighting this because why? Because smallpox is the only other uh, is the only human virus that has been eradicated thanks to vaccines. And by the way, just so you know, there are two total uh, uh, viral pathogens that have been eradicated by vaccines. One is smallpox in humans, and the other is rinderpest, uh, which was a serious disease in cattle. Uh, all right, continuing on with this list, this list also has Ebola virus, it has HIV, and so on. But again, thanks to uh, the advances in science, HIV-positive patients uh, with drugs can now keep the HIV RNA virus under control and live pretty much a completely healthy life, uh, such that they won't even transmit the virus to their partner as long as the viral RNA counts are below a certain threshold. Uh, so when I, as a virologist, study viruses, here's how what I think of them. Viruses have a nucleic acid genome, either RNA or DNA. As you know, we humans have DNA. They're encapsulated in a shell or envelope, and they require a host to propagate. Here's an image of the Ebola virus under electron microscope, and here's one of the flu virus. And when you look closely, you can see the filamentous structure of Ebola with the RNA strand inside. When you look at the flu virus closely, you'll see that it also has an RNA genome, but it has an eight-segmented RNA genome as well. Now, uh, this is important. Not all viruses infect humans. Uh, in fact, almost every life form on the planet is infected by virus or viruses. On the top is an example of a virus that causes disease in the tobacco plant, the tobacco mosaic virus. And on the bottom is a bacteriophage uh, shown artistically on the right, rendered by an artist. And here's an electron microscope where these viruses, they look like these spaceships that attach to the surface of a bacteria and they can infect bacteria. Quick sip of coffee. We always thought viruses were small uh, creatures uh, that could pass 
that could pass filters. But uh, in the in the 2000s, scientists discovered viruses that infect um, other single cell organisms like the amoeba. And here is an article that says giant virus resurrected from 30,000 year old ice. And uh, what they found, this virus, uh, which they designated as pithovirus, and there were other uh, species known as Mimi virus and Pandora virus, they're actually quite large. Over here in this image, the size comparison is given to the HIV, uh, human, human immunodeficiency virus here, and to rhinovirus. And look at pithovirus, it's almost as big as a bacteria. So these types of findings are changing our notions of what viruses are. We always thought they were much, much smaller than a bacterium, but they can be as close in size to an E. coli bacteria. And there's also this concept called infectious RNA, where these are infectious nucleic acid sequences where just the sequence itself, there's no capsid, there's no envelope, but just the sequence itself is sufficient to cause disease. And here's an example of, a, these are called viroids, and here's an example of a viroid infecting a potato plant, and it's called a potato spindle, a spindle tuber viroid. And under electron microscope, you can actually see the RNA strands. So this is crazy. This is, uh, this is crazy because here's an example of an infectious piece of RNA that can survive, that can pass on its life without the need for any shell or any complex metabolism. It actually truly changes the definition of life, doesn't it? Because us as humans, with our anthropomorphism, when we look at life, we think of creatures that live, breathe, eat, have a metabolism. But here are creatures on the planet that uh, don't need any of those complexities and yet can still transmit their genomes and their genes. All right, continuing on. Uh, when we look in nature, my friends, viruses are the most abundant life form in the ocean. Uh, and they are the reservoir of the most genetic diversity in the seas. A single drop of ocean water has billions and billions of viral particles. Here's a pie chart trying to demonstrate that where uh, the prokaryotes, so bacteria, for example, are the yellow part of this pie slice and the viruses represent the abundance in blue here. And so when you ask me, Semi, what is a virus? I basically say viruses are nothing but transmission of nucleic acids. And uh, viruses, just like humans, just like every other creature on the planet, are trying to uh, do nothing but spread their genes, replicate their sequences. So all of us exist in this world with the momentum and the acceleration of reproduction of our genome. And viruses are no different than us in that regard. Uh, and they play a critical role in evolution of life and all of life. Uh, there's a scientific phenomenon known as horizontal gene transfer. When you look at the phylogenetic tree of life, looking at bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, we are under the eukaryotes, right? And uh, we can see that viruses have played a critical role in gene transfer events that, has, that have happened throughout evolution between all these species. So going back to what is a virus and how we think of viruses as pathogens, uh, here I am trying to change that concept just for a little bit before we talk about COVID-19, even though that's a pathogen. Uh, with pathogenic viruses, we think of viruses like Ebola. Uh, by the way, my friends, uh, there was the 11th uh, Ebola outbreak in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. Uh, and uh, that was abolished this year. So as you know, West Africa has suffered many Ebola cases and this year was the 11th. But the Ebola vaccine, which has been uh, given uh, approval in 2019, was used in the 11th Ebola outbreak this year in the Democrat Republic of Congo. All right, so we think of viruses as pathogens, but uh, the majority of viruses are not pathogenic. In fact, a lot of them uh, are beneficial to their host. And one way to think of viruses is in the form of persistence, uh, i.e. they leave a genetic imprint. And an example of this are endogenous viruses. Um, here is a, an image from 1975 showing a baboon pre-implantation embryo. And in this embryo, they saw these virus-like particles and they didn't quite know what these meant. And I'll explain what this means in just a moment. When the human genome was sequenced and the draft genome was published in 2001, 
Uh, and here, uh, this is the title from 2001. Here's an image from 2006. What we found out is what we call genes in the human genome is only 1% to 2% of the entire human genome. And just think of this for a moment, my friends. Uh, you, me, uh, what we think of genes and our genetic elements uh, are only 1% to 2% of our genome. That's pretty significant. So what does the rest of our genome do then? Well, uh, what scientists found is originally they called the rest of the genome junk DNA because they didn't know what it did. But later over the years, uh, we found this out. It turns out half of our genome uh, shown in this left half pie here is remnants and relics of ancient viral elements i repeat my friends half of our genome are relics and uh, leftovers of ancient viral infections either in the form of uh, genetic fossils or other so let's talk about this a little bit uh, how can this happen? How can we have viral sequences in our genome? How do those sequences integrate? Well, uh, we know from retroviruses, and by the way, HIV belongs to the class, large class of retroviruses. We know that retroviruses, when they infect a cell, uh, their genome enters the cytoplasm and then enters the nucleus. And then their genetic material in the form of DNA will integrate into the host genome. And as long as this cell is alive, that viral sequence will persist in that cell as well. And from this viral sequence, uh, this uh, virus will produce more uh, gen genomic material and more proteins in order to generate other viruses and spread. This is why, for example, uh, in HIV patients, uh, the HIV sequence is permanently embedded. And except for a very few rare cases of only two or three, uh, it is uh, it is really tricky to eradicate HIV from infected people. But the drugs, thankfully, do work really well. Now, uh, when we think of vi viruses like COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 disease, or HIV, uh, the typical infectious virus cycle fo follows as such. Uh, people get infected, and then they spread this to others in a horizontal transmission route, either through respiratory or through blood or through uh, feces and other bodily fluids or through sex. Uh, and however, in rare cases, if a germline gets infected, and by germline, I mean these are the ovaries or sperm cells, if they get infected, and if they get infected with a retrovirus-like virus that can integrate into the genome, then and, and those people have children, then what happens is every single cell in their body is uh, has this viral sequence in them. And then when they procreate and have offspring, of course, now we have humans, just like us today, where half of our genome is remnants of viral elements. So what do these viral elements in our genome do? Let's talk about this a little bit. I showed you this image a moment ago. This is from 1975, a baboon pre-implantation embryo. And there were these virus-like particles that they noticed in the electron microscope. They didn't know what these were at the time, but later it, it turns out uh, these viruses play a critical role in mammalian evolution and human evolution as well and, and reproduction. So when we were all a baby in our mother's womb, as a fetus, we look something like this, and the, the placenta plays a very important layer uh, and role. It feeds us, it protects us, and it nourishes us. But if you zoom in to the placenta in this little box here, what you see is this multicellular layer of cells that's called the syncytiotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast is formed by many cells coming together as shown here on the bottom, and those cells fuse and they produce this sheath. And that is very important in placenta and fetus formation. It turns out uh, the key factor that allows the fusion of these cells is comes from a virus, not just any virus, but a virus that happens to be in our genome. So one of these genomic viral elements that I told you about, it is the envelope protein of what used to be probably an infectious retrovirus. It's not infectious anymore, and most of the genome is pseudogenized, meaning it's non-functional. However, its envelope protein is still functional in our genome, and during pregnancy, it allows the layer of uh, the formation of this important layer by fusing cells. 
So much so that, in fact, uh, one of my favorite uh, science, popular science writers, Carl Zimmer, in the Discover magazine in 2012 said, if not for a virus, none of us would ever be born. I mean, I think this is pretty cool because when you think about viruses, here we are always used to thinking of viruses as causing disease. But instead, uh, here's an example of viruses that actually have allowed us to exist and they are beneficial to us in this regard. All right, uh, now there are other examples, not just in humans. When we look in nature, there are parasitic wasps, for example. Uh, parasitic wasps, they uh, inject their larvae into caterpillars, and then a few days later, the larvae hatch. And then interestingly enough, this caterpillar starts looking after this larvae as if it's, is its, its own. And it will form a cocoon around them and it will starve itself to death, taking care of this offspring. And these larvae will become other parasitic wasps. It turns out viruses play a role in this as well. There are endogenous viruses known as polydenovirus, recovirus, and nudivirus in these wasps. Here is an electron microscope. Uh, during larvae delivery, these wasps also deliver these viruses, and these viruses suppress the immunity of the caterpillar and alter their behavior, therefore enabling the life cycle of parasitic wasps. Here's another example, uh, our, our friend Mickey Rourke here, the actor Mickey Rourke, and this bacteriophage on the right have something in common. Do you know what it is? Let me take a sip of coffee. So uh, what it is is Botox. If you have used Botox or use Botox or you know somebody who is using Botox, yes, Botox comes, Botox is a toxin in bacteria known as Clostridium botulinum. Um, however, this, the origin of the genetic element for this toxin comes from a virus, a bacteriophage that infects these bacteria. So again, if you use Botox, my friends, if you use Botox or if you plan to use Botox for any reason, you can thank a virus. All right. Uh, so, uh, and not only viruses, but every time our genome reproduces, as you know, every time our cells divide, our genome has to reproduce. But even within our genome, there are elements. There are elements that are not viruses, but are virus-like. They are basically nucleic acids in our genome that want to spread, that have evolved to spread. And these are called transposons, and they will spread through a mechanism known as cut and paste, or through copy and paste. And with every live birth of humans, there are about a handful, about four to five of these new transposon insertions in every live birth. And what this means is really significant because we humans, not only through viruses, but through these replicating elements, we are, uh, we, we owe a lot to these replicating elements for our evolution and our existence. So in summary of what a virus is, my friends, viruses, yes, they're pathogenic and COVID-19 is a pathogenic virus, but the majority of viruses are not pathogenic. In fact, some of them have helped shape the evolution of humans and life. Let's continue. Now back to coronavirus. So after that introduction, my friends, uh, thank you for your patience. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about viruses because this will be important in analyzing COVID-19 a little better and understanding it a little better. When we look at the coronavirus, it's called a corona because it, ha it has this solar-like shape as in the corona of a sun. On the outside, we see these proteins and of these, the, this red spike protein is very important, shown in red here. And on the inside, coronaviruses have an RNA genome. And in fact, for all the RNA viruses, the coronavirus genome is the largest. Uh, just to give you a comparison, the HIV genome is about 10,000 base pairs and the uh, coronavirus genome is about 30,000. So about three times as large. All right. Uh, and uh, there are at least eight coronaviruses that are known to infect humans. We already know SARS-CoV-2, so that's COVID-19. Uh, we already know SARS from 2012, and we already know MERS from, sorry, SARS from 2002, and we already know MERS from 2012. Beyond this, there are also four seasonal coronaviruses that have been infecting humans for decades, if not hundreds of years, and they cause the common cold-like symptoms. And they're known as 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1. 
And beyond this, there's an eighth coronavirus that doesn't cause disease in humans, but we know it has the potential to infect humans, and it's, it's known as SADS-CoV, and SADS-CoV comes from swine, and we know that in lab experiments it has the potential to infect humans. Let me introduce you to the family of coronaviruses. Let's start from the bottom. So SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is related to SARS and MERS because it's a beta coronavirus and it exists down here. And the cousins of beta coronaviruses are alpha, gamma, and delta coronaviruses, and they belong to the subfamily and family of coronaviridae. And they belong to this large order known as nidoviralis. And under here, the family members include, of course, coronaviridae, but also arteriviridae, mesonaviridae, and ronaviridae. So this is a really large family. And when we look closely at the coronavirinae subfamily phylogeny, uh, we see the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. My friends, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening over here. Uh, if you can take a sequence, a genetic sequence of any creature, you can compare it to other related creatures, and you can create what's called a phylogenetic tree. For example, when people do DNA fingerprinting for court cases or for FBI investigations, or simply for tracking somebody's parents or children, or if you've ever done 23andMe, your genetic sequence get com gets compared with other genetic sequences, and then you end up with a tree just like this. And you can do this for humans, and you can do this for viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 is a beta, beta coronavirus. It is closely related to bat coronaviruses and human SARS. And the other beta coronaviruses are shown here, MERS and these other two, HKUN and OC43. Uh, and then the other two are shown here as alpha coronaviruses, uh, 229E and NL63. Now, uh, here's an important thing. Vir these coronaviruses, there are thousands of them. There are thousands and they infect all sorts of life. These coronaviruses infect not only humans, but uh, some of these will infect bats. They will infect uh, swine, so pigs. They will infect cats. They will infect mice, birds. They will in even inf in infect whales. Beluga whales have coronaviruses. They belong to the gamma coronavirus family down here, known as uh, beluga whale coronavirus SW1. So. Did you know that coronaviruses can also infect this many species? I hope uh, this is helpful. All right, my friends. So uh, how does this happen? How do outbreaks like SARS-CoV-2, SARS, or MERS happen? Well, this is called zoonosis. Zoonosis is a transmission of infectious agents from vertebrate animals to humans. And uh, it turns out that there are a lot of viruses that are pathogenic to humans that come from bats. And we'll talk about bats in just a second. Bats are not only really cool creatures, but somehow they have evolved to live successfully with these viruses without getting Ill, like humans do. On the right is an example of the seven coronaviruses that uh, infect humans. SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor on human cells. We know it originated from a bat, but we don't know if there was a middle host. MERS from 2012 uses a different receptor. Uh, it came from bats to camels and then from camels to humans. And it's for this reason where the MERS outbreak happened in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia where camel and human interactions are common. SARS in 2002 also came from bats, but through civet dogs and cats, through to humans. Uh, and here are the other seasonal coronaviruses that cause flu-like or uh, simply cold symptoms. And they use different receptors and they came either from bats or rodents and through either llamas or cows or through unknown middle hosts. So pretty much, my friends, every pathogen, every human pathogen on the planet so far, almost every one of them came from an animal out there. And as long as human and animal interactions occur, especially in the wild, this is a risk. Uh, you may have heard that HIV came from chimpanzees and other um, uh, apes or evolved through monkeys. And that's another example of zoonosis. Ebola comes from bats. So talking about bats, why bats? What is it about bats that are so special? Well, when we look at bats versus humans, uh, this is not simply that bats have a better immune response or humans have a worse immune response. No, my friends, the immune system is not that easy to simply describe in binary terms of good or bad. But the immune system is like a complex cloud. Think of it like a cloud that can stretch 
or narrow and extend its arms. And this way, it can create different types of immunity. So it turns out there are two very key molecules that are integral to living, coexisting, or fighting viral infections. And those are two molecules known as interferon and tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, or beta. And the names of these are not that important other than I just want you to keep in mind that these molecules exist in bats and humans as well as in many other mammals. And it turns out that bats have a greater interferon response compared to humans, whereas humans have a greater TNF response compared to bats. And this actually results in uh, humans not being that good about responding right away to these infections, whereas bats are. But when humans respond with their TNF molecules, the TNF molecules actually cause a lot of the damage in the lungs of COVID-19 patients. Uh, yes, my friends, you heard that right. What I just said is that the immune system in the human is responsible for causing the damage seen in COVID-19. Why does this happen? Here is a beautiful cartoon illustrating the immunopathology of COVID-19. COVID-19 is an illness of the uh, immune system attacking the human body. I repeat, uh, COVID-19, yes, it's caused by the virus, but the damage to the organs is not caused directly by the virus, but uh, it's caused by your immune system trying to attack the virus and trying to kill infected cells. And that's how all the damage in the lungs occur. So for example, there are, uh, there are responses in the cells. There are molecules that are secreted. There are cytokines that are secreted in response to COVID-19. Uh, these cytokines are especially important. Here is that TNF I just told you about and the IFN, the interferon I just told you about. And these molecules by getting secreted will actually cause a lot of the damage in the lungs. In fact, so much so that in serious COVID-19 patients, some of the treatments that are approved for use are drugs like dexamethasone or tocilizumab. These drugs actually try to suppress the immune system so that the immune system uh, gives a break and uh, doesn't attack these lung tissues as much, therefore causing damage. All right, and here is a great example of the type of damage that doctors and physicians see. Uh, here is a section of a human chest, and these spaces are the lung, and these spaces are supposed to be clear and black. Uh, but what you see is all the scar tissue and all these infections uh, shown in the yellow arrow. Uh, I'm not a physician, uh, I'm a PhD scientist, so I, I may not be correctly interpreting this medical chart, but basically the idea is that the damage in uh, these lungs are a result of the immune system attacking the cells. Let's look at the coronavirus life cycle. Here's coronavirus attaching to the cell and it can't infect any cell, uh, it infects cells that have this receptor called ACE2. Every virus, my friends, every virus binds to a receptor on a cell or multiple receptors, and it uses those to enter cells. Uh, there are other ways of entry, but uh, as far as life cycles are concerned, receptors are key. And once it enters the cell, it has a completely cytoplasmic life cycle. Unlike other viruses that may integrate into the nucleus, shown down here in green, coronaviruses stay in the cytoplasm. Its RNA genome produces other protein subunits to make more viruses, and it also copies its RNA genome to encapsidate and shed new virions. Uh, now let's get to vaccines. So here is another coronavirus life cycle, once again, a coronavirus infecting a cell. And here are the antigens that are produced in those cells in response to the infection. And normally, in a healthy immune system, you will in trigger uh, T cell responses known as T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells, as well as B cell responses, which help produce antibodies. And this is uh, exactly highlighting the complexity of the immune system because the immune system is not just antibodies or cells, but the immune system is a really complex phenomenon. In fact, uh, not just antibodies or cells. So here is coronavirus. And here is a cartoon of an antibody responding to coronavirus. Here are some cartoons of different cells, macrophages, T cells, et cetera, responding to the virus. So not only do you have these responses, but also inside the cell. When a virus infects the cell, 
intracellularly, there are all these other responses that sense the RNA genome and respond, or they sense other pr viral proteins and respond, and they trigger these immune cascades. And here is, again, those two molecules I mentioned earlier, IFN on the bottom, interferon, and TNF, tumor necrosis factor. And these are in response to some of these infections. So in COVID-19 patients, even in serious patients, the immune system is working fine. In fact, really, really well. And that's what's causing some of the damage seen in these patients. And it's quite paradoxical to think about it, isn't it? All right. Continuing on, in fact, when you look inside the cell, so the immune system is a result of millions of years of evolution, and there are dozens and dozens of cell types and thousands of molecules. Even when you look inside of each of these cells, T cells, B cells, monocytes, you will see this very complex molecular structure and molecular interactions that are helping uh, protect us and, and framing our immune response. And also remember, my friends, our immune response is not meant to be perfect. Our immune response simply is the result of humans evolving and adapting to their environment. And whatever was sufficient to bring us here so that we can continue procreating is what we're seeing today. All right, uh, let's go back to now vaccines and start focusing on vaccines. Uh, there are two key types of responses that vaccines attempt to trigger. One of them is the production of antibodies that comes from B cells, and the other is cellular immunity that comes in the form of T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells. And when we look at data from the Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccine, this is from the FDA briefing document, you actually see these responses working really well. Here, the scientists were testing different doses of their COVID-19 vaccine and asking if they see a T cell response. And yes, they do. They see a very nice CD4 and a CD8 T cell response. And then they were asking, in different doses over time, do they see antibodies? And yes, they do. In fact, they see not only antibodies, but they also see these antibodies are able to neutralize the virus. So uh, this type of data is really positive. Now, this is uh, from the early clinical trials and from early preclinical data sets. And of course, we all know how positive the clinical data are. All right, when we look at the New York Times vaccine tracker, this is open to public. You can check this every day, every week. Uh, this was updated January 9th, so it's recent as of yesterday. Uh, there are more than 60, in fact, up close to 90, almost 100 now vaccines in clinical trials. And as you know, clinical trials are in phase one, phase two, and phase three. And we'll talk a little bit about this. And some of these have been approved. <clears throat> Coffee break. Uh, if you look at the World Health Organization draft landscape of COVID-19 candidate vaccines, you'll see that there are uh, more than 200 total vaccines being developed from all over the world. And this is open to public and you can see uh, whether it's in phase one, two or three, and you can follow the links. And let's talk about vaccines. In summary, there are four types of vaccines being developed for COVID-19. One is known as a virus vaccine or an inactivated uh, or partially inactivated virus vaccine or replicating virus vaccine. The other is known as a nucleic acid vaccine. Here, either DNA or RNA is delivered as a vaccine. The other is known as a viral vector vaccine. Here, a, a sequence or a portion of the virus is delivered using what's called a viral vector. And I'll talk about viral vectors in just a moment or there are protein-based vaccines. Here, a subunit or several subunits of the virus in question is being delivered as a recombinant protein vaccine. And all these different vaccine subtypes shown in different colors, whether it's recombinant or replication incompetent or DNA or RNA in, are in different phases of preclinical, phase one, phase two, and so on clinical trials. And let's look at the companies and get familiar with some of the companies. Here's an example of 10 candidate vaccines. Uh, Sinovac is from China and they are producing an inactivated virus. And uh, also from China is another company called Sinopharm it, that's producing inactivated viruses in collaboration with the Wuhan Institute or the Beijing Institute of Biological Products. From England, uh, the University of Oxford in collaboration with AstraZeneca is producing a viral vector vaccine. CanSino from China is uh, producing a viral vector vaccine. So in, in Russia, the Gamalaya as well. 
and then so on and so forth. And we have a protein subunit vaccine from Novavax. And of course, what you've been hearing a lot is the RNA vaccine, which has been uh, approved for emergency use uh, in the US as well as several other countries, both from Moderna and Pfizer. So uh, covering all these vaccines one by one, let's start with the inactive virus vaccine. Uh, an example of this is the Chinese Sinovac vaccine. So the virus is produced in the lab. So for example, from a patient, they will take a, a sample from a COVID-19 patient. They took several samples of viruses and then they chose one of them. And then they produce this in the lab at really large volumes. And then they inactivate this virus using chemicals or irradiation. In the case of Sinovac, they use chemicals. Uh, and uh, what happens is you are vaccinated with this inactivated dead virus and it's given uh, into the muscle and your antigen presenting cells, they take up this inactive dead virus and then they present its peptides and this triggers the immune response. When we look at the recombinant protein vaccine, the example here is Novavax and here the virus protein, particularly the coronavirus spike protein, the spike protein is that protein that attaches to the cell receptor. It's produced in the lab from tissue culture and it is delivered uh, also to you as an injection and then your antigen presenting cells will pick up these proteins and present the peptides and trigger an immune response. There's a similar version of this called virus-like particles and in the virus-like particles uh, it's also a type of a protein vaccine except that it looks more like a virus-like particle but it's not infectious, it doesn't have a genome but it works similarly. Examples of recombinant protein vaccines that are approved are hepatitis B and HPV. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, the inactive virus uh, examples include uh, hepatitis A and the polio vaccine. All right, let's get to now the viral vector vaccines. The example uh, for COVID-19 is AstraZeneca Oxford. And here what happens is the virus spike protein, again, the protein of the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus that attaches to cells, the DNA sequence is delivered using adenoviral vectors. What is an adenoviral vector? Let me explain this for a moment. So every year uh, there are about nine viruses that cause respiratory syndromes. Respiratory syndromes can be caused by coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, flu viruses, adenoviruses, and so on and so forth. And adenovirus is one of these. Uh, so it doesn't cause serious infections in healthy humans. But what you can do is you can take adenoviruses in the lab and you can modify them so they don't cause disease, but you can use them as tools to deliver uh, RNA or DNA, in this case, DNA. And uh, you can, and, and adenoviruses have been used since the 80s in clinical trials as well as being developed. So uh, that's what a viral vector is. It's called a viral vector because it's not like a virus, but it still works almost like a virus. And what happens is when you're injected with this viral vector, it will uh, infect a cell just like using a receptor and attach to those cells. And uh, there is a DNA sequence for, for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. That DNA sequence will produce the peptides and you'll get an immune response. And an example of an approved uh, viral vector vaccine is Gendesine. It's a vaccine that was approved for head and neck cancers. And all right, and here we are finally to the RNA or DNA vaccines. Uh, I'll be talking about RNA vaccines because there aren't that many DNA vaccines that are in the front runners for COVID-19. So the example RNA vaccine for COVID-19 is Pfizer and Moderna. And the virus spike protein is delivered, the RNA sequence is delivered with lipid nanoparticles. So shown in this figure here, uh, you generate these lipid nanoparticles. These are like almost like soap droplets, microscopic soap droplets. And inside they have an RNA sequence. And these uh, nanoparticles are taken by the cells. And the life cycle of these RNA molecules are completely cytoplasmic. And in the cytoplasm, they produce proteins, uh, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And then your antigen presenting cells will present these and you get an immune response. And the example for approved vaccines for this is of course the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Now let's talk a little bit about my friends, the clinical trials. Uh, the clinical trials begin with, uh, they, they're, they, they're preceded by 
discovery and preclinical research, which can take months, years. And then you do phase one, phase two, and phase three. In phase one, you do in about a dozen or so healthy volunteers, just to make sure the vaccine doesn't cause any unwanted side effects. And then you can also look at uh, immune responses and things like that. In phase two, you do the same, but now in hundreds of people. And then in phase three, you do the same, but in thousands of people. And you also make sure that the virus, uh, the, the, the vaccine is actually working. So it's preventing infection or it's reducing symptoms or both. Uh, and also the unfortunate truth is that during cl clinical development or preclinical development, a lot of drug and vaccine candidates will diminish over time because uh, there's only about a 10% rate at which drugs or vaccines get approved. A lot of them are eliminated even either in the preclinical stage or at the phase one stage or at the phase two or at the phase three stage. Me and my colleagues have been uh, developing vaccines or drugs or gene and cell therapies uh, for the last 10 years now, uh, interacting with the FDA. And it's just one of those sad truths that not every idea becomes a beneficial drug or vaccine. And that's a good thing because the FDA and the agencies and the scientists are all following the data to make sure that what is being developed is safe and efficacious. All right, continuing on. Uh, one of the questions I get a lot is how did these vaccines get approved and developed so quickly? And I wanna talk a little bit about that, the speed at which this was done, because the speed was unprecedented. And never in the history of science have we ended up with an infectious disease vaccine that allowed us to uh, become this successful in this short amount of time. So let's talk about how did these happen so quickly. All right, so here is a diagram illustrating the traditional development route on the top row and the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 vaccine route on the bottom row. Uh, let me take a sip of my coffee while you take a look at this chart. Traditionally, uh, when you have an idea, ideas and lab experiments can take years if not decades and it's true for both traditional vaccines and for COVID-19 vaccines the research that brought us here has taken decades and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment and then finally when you do animal experiments that can take years but due to the urgency of the situation and due to the investments uh, uh, scientists were able to generate animal studies in, and data in a very short amount of time and then you submit what's called an IND. IND stands for Investigational New Drug. And this is submitted to the FDA. And this gives you permission to start your clinical trials. And sometimes due to bureaucracy, due to a waiting list, because the FDA is a government organization, this can take months, years, you never know. And of course, because of the COVID-19 urgency, these submissions were accelerated. And traditionally in clinical trials, you will do phase one, phase two, and phase three, all back to back. Uh, but Due to COVID-19, uh, these timings were combined in a way to be creative and efficient, but without compromising from safety and efficacy. And then when you have your clinical data, you submit what's called a BLA, a biologics li license application. And this is to get a traditional approval. And the approval process can also take years because uh, of bureaucracy or just waiting in line or reviews of documents. And then once it's approved, traditional vaccines, then you will produce your vaccine. And this can take months as well. However, what the companies now did for COVID-19, they started producing their vaccines at risk. They did this because they wanted millions of doses to be available, and there were a lot of incentives from governments as well to make sure uh, this was available as well, uh, uh, both in the US as well as in many other countries. And when these companies submit their uh, data for FDA approval, what they're getting is not a traditional biologics, li biological license application approval. What they are getting is what's called an uh, emergency use approval. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Emergency use approvals um, are given only under emergency circumstances like COVID-19. And uh, they allow you to administer a drug or a vaccine if it, the data supports that it is safe and efficacious and that will, it will benefit uh, the patients. And here is an example of the Pfizer FDA briefing document, just talking a little bit about timelines. So the two vaccines for Pfizer, the RNA vaccine, are given three weeks apart. And then the follow-up period is for two years. And as you already know, uh, this two years is still ongoing. It hasn't been completed. What this means is that the phase three follow-up periods are 
ongoing right now. And uh, what the FDA wanted, the FDA wanted was Pfizer and Moderna to submit their documents for emergency use approval two months after the second dose. So two months after the second dose allowed them to submit these documents. And that's what we have today is the emergency use approvals. Now let's talk a little bit about RNA vaccines. Uh, RNA vaccines, I mentioned they are an RNA molecule that encode the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, spike protein sequence. They're delivered in these lipid nanoparticles and they're taken up by your cells. And this messenger RNA, mRNA stands for messenger RNA. Mistakenly, people refer to this as modified RNA. That's not true. This is messenger RNA. All our cells in our bodies have messenger RNA, and this is also messenger RNA that encodes the virus spike protein. In the cytoplasm, this, uh, this produces the protein, and that triggers the immune response we talked about earlier, the antibodies and the T-cell responses. And uh, the Moderna vaccine, here's a slide from Moderna, so you get vaccinated in your deltoid muscle on the shoulder, and then once inside the cell, your ribosomes will produce proteins from this sequence in the cytoplasm, and this will trigger either a CD8, B cell, or CD4 immune responses. And uh, he, this is key. mRNA is actually a transformative technique for vaccine development. Uh, during COVID-19, we have seen the success of this platform and the speed at which it can be executed. And in this diagram, what I'm showing you is that uh, from a target pathogen, you can sequence the genome and look at the sequence digitally, design an mRNA sequence vaccine and start producing your vaccine and doing experiments right away. And this is groundbreaking, my friends, because with this, with this type of technology, not only do we have a COVID vaccine today in as short as 10 months, but we also ha will have vaccines for future pandemics as well as other current diseases, not just viral diseases, but other diseases as well. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Uh, coming back to the slide I showed in the beginning, so in the cover of Time and in Der Spiegel, these two founders and scientists from BioNTech in Germany, uh, who are Turkish immigrants who either moved from Turkey to Germany or were born in Germany to Turkish immigrant parents, uh, Ur Shahin and Özlem Türeci, they uh, are on these covers. And of course, this makes all of us Turkish immigrants very proud. Uh, but also, uh, it's, I, I congratulate them. But one thing we have to keep in mind, my friends, as you know, uh, these technologies exist on the shoulders of giants because mRNA technologies were being developed since the 1990s. The first company to develop mRNA vaccines uh, was CureVac in Germany. It was founded in 2008, and then BioNTech was founded in 2000, sorry, 2000, and then BioNTech was founded in 2008, and then Moderna in the US was founded in 2010. And human clinical trials with mRNA vaccines have been ongoing since 2008. Uh, and here is a pipeline of the Moderna vaccine, uh, Mo uh, sorry, Moderna mRNA uh, pipeline. And over here, you can see the examples of the different types of viruses and infections they've been going after. Cytomegalovirus, Zika virus, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, metanuma virus, influenza, Epstein-Barr virus, and so on. And also here are different cancers that they have been trying to develop mRNA vaccines against. mRNA vaccine technology has been really promising in the cancer field because of the way it works. It seems it is able to trigger a really unique response that you need to combat cancer that some of the other cancer vaccines don't seem to do so well with. All right, uh, but I want to highlight another scientist as well, um, Katalin Kariko. She's from Hungary, and she is the scientist, the true scientist behind the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. She uh, came to the US and uh, University of Pennsylvania, and she, from day one, from the 90s, she has been trying to develop RNA vaccine technologies, because she believed this would be very important one day. In fact, she really struggled getting funding, so much so that the University of Pennsylvania gave her an ultimatum of either you have to leave or you have to get demoted. She wanted to continue her work, so she chose to get demoted. 
she got demoted and uh, she actually started getting less pay compared to the technicians working in her lab. Uh, but this didn't stop her because what she did is she started collaborating with another scientist called Drew Weissman. Drew Weissman is also at the University of Pennsylvania and together they started publishing very important work. So here is the original paper from 1998. This is 23 years ago, my friends, if I did the math right. And uh, here is Katalin Kariko again. And she figured out how she could deliver mRNA or plasmid DNA using these cationic lipid complexes. And this uh, it allowed us today to use these lipid nanoparticles I told you about. All right. And then what they did, so here's Drew Weissman. So she and Drew Weissman started collaborating together. And what they discovered, my friends, is that these RNA molecules, if you add these into cells, uh, they are actually sensed by an immune response in the cell. That immune response is TLR, also known as toll-like receptors. And this immune response actually hinders the success of RNA technology. So they had to figure out a way to overcome this hindrance uh, towards delivering RNA to these cells. So what did they do? Well, here's what they discovered. They discovered in 2008 that if you incorporate a chemical known as pseudouridine into mRNA, you can overcome these barriers. What is pseudouridine? Well, here's a cartoon of an RNA strand, a single strand of RNA, and RNA has these four nucleosides and these four nucleobases. And uh, they substitute one of these, uridine, instead with pseudouridine. And there's a very subtle, very subtle molecular change here. And with this, they realize that they can overcome this uh, immune response in the cell to make RNA technology successful. So my friends, here we are today with a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine with data that goes back to 1998, 2005, 2008, and thanks to amazing scientists like uh, Drew Weissman and Katalin Kariko. And for this reason, Kariko is known as the mother of mRNA vaccines by some circles, and she is phenomenal, and I congratulate her perseverance. And this is also a true story of uh, female scientists also trying to struggle to get funding, to get their voices across, and ending up in the situation she did. But she persevered and she succeeded. And that is phenomenal. All right, and here, this uh, photo almost brings me to tears every time I look at it. This is a photo of Kariko and Weissman getting vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine that they have been uh, helping develop uh, with mRNA technology for the past almost now 30 years. This is the beauty of science. This is why I do science. I don't think I will be this successful ever, but I love being in this circle of scientists because it is just a phenomenal moment and a phenomenal success story for bringing these things together. All right, now uh, let's talk a little bit more about these technologies. Uh, so I, I gave you a history of what Carico did to enable mRNA vaccines, but there are two key technologies used in the COVID-19 vaccine and uh, that enabled headlines like this. And one of them, I already told you, it's incorporation of the pseudouridine, and it helps to overcome these toll-like receptor barriers in the cell. So it makes sure that your RNA molecule works in the cell like it's supposed to. Number two, I haven't told you about this yet, but number two is substitution of two amino acids in the spike protein. So let me tell you a little bit about this. When viruses, when viruses bind to a cell, they often exist in a pre-fusion conformation. And when they fuse, they become, they undergo a conformational change. And that's called a post-fusion conformation. So when you're developing a vaccine, it's important for you to choose, do you want to target the pre-fusion before it enters the cell or the post-fusion? Uh, and there may be reasons to choose one or the other of both. But for COVID-19, it turns out that uh, people had to 
use this prefusion confirmation. And guess what? The science of using this prefusion confirmation, and here is an image of the molecular structure of that, came from 2017. This paper is from 2017, after the 2012 MERS outbreak, when scientists were studying MERS and coronaviruses, they discovered that uh, these uh, conformational changes were key. And if you introduce these two proline amino acids, you can actually uh, keep this prefusion conformation. So this is important in the vaccine. Um, I hope this wasn't this wasn't too technical. I'm just trying to make you appreciate that there were two very key modifications. One, to make sure the RNA gets in the cell and works in the cell. Two, to make sure that the RNA sequence is going to target the virus, the prefusion virus, before it enters the cells. All right. And uh, the other key thing here is that mRNA vaccine is going to be a revolution in the field of vaccinology because it will enable pandemic preparedness and being ready for the next pandemics. Uh, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic. It's not the only pandemic right now. Uh, let's not forget about the HIV AIDS pandemic as well, which has been ongoing since the 80s. And it's not gonna be the last pandemic. There will be several pandemics. As long as life continues, there will always be pandemics. So mRNA vaccines may actually help enable pandemic preparedness. And here's a really cool publication from August 2020 that tried to adapt this model to a different virus. So it took the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA technology and it said, can I apply this to a different virus, assuming this different virus was a brand new virus that just showed up? So as a model, they used MERS, the 2012 Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. And what they showed is that within just a matter of weeks, they could get, they could not only generate this vaccine, the mRNA vaccine against MERS, but they could see antibody responses. And in mouse experiments, they could see that the viral load in the lungs were reduced and the lungs were protected. So this was key. My friends, we were also very lucky with COVID-19 vaccines. And the reason for this is there are several vaccine, uh, viruses that don't have any working vaccines. And scientists have been working for decades. HIV is one example. Herpes is another. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is another. Respiratory syncytial, syncytial virus, RSV, say that three times really fast. It causes uh, one of the, uh, it's one of the top reasons for hospitalization of children due to respiratory syndrome uh, in developed nations. And it's a significant uh, cost to the industry as well as to health. And, but unfortunately, RSV vaccines have not been successful. So why were we lucky? with the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, because there's a phenomenon in vaccines called ADE. ADE stands for Antibody Dependent Enhancement. What is ADE? When uh, we saw ADE, so scientists saw ADE when they were developing vaccines against RSV, when they were developing vaccines against Zika virus, and they also saw it in dengue virus. And unfortunately for that reason, there aren't vaccines for those viruses yet. Uh, what happens is when these animals or people get vaccinated, uh, by the way, this was all in clinical trials or animal experiments. None of these have been approved for use. Uh, the people or the animals will produce antibodies and those antibodies will bind to the virus and they will serve as a bridge between the virus and uninfected cells. And it will actually cause cells that are normally not infected to be infected by this virus. And this will result in serious illness uh, known as VAERD. VAERD is vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease. And we were lucky, my friends, because we could have seen this with COVID-19, but we didn't. So for, so for this reason, today we have a successful COVID-19 vaccine and we're able to uh, continue and implement these vaccinations. So uh, in summary of the vaccines, um, the fastest vaccine produced to date uh, prior to COVID was for mumps. It took four years and it was developed in the 1960s. And of course, as you can imagine, in year 2020, the technology is different, the investments are different, the type of cooperation, thanks to the internet, thanks to other things are different today. And with the FDA or other agencies giving EUA, emergency use authorization, we now have COVID mRNA vaccines and we'll have other vaccines in just a matter of one year or less. And my friends, this is the true success of science, 
vaccinology, immunology, and scientists, technicians working hard uh, to make all this happen. All right, so now let's talk about mutations and I'm gonna wrap my talk and try to take questions. So mutations are often misunderstood. Uh, people think mutations are like ninja mutant turtles or like the X-Men, they give superpowers and things like that. And while these films are fun to watch, although I'm not a big fan, uh, they're still fun to fantasize and think in terms of science fiction. But the reality of mut mutations is mutations are normal. Mutations happen all the time and uh, in all walks of life. And trillions of mutations per person happen per day. In you, in me, every single day, trillions of mutations. Why? Uh, because every time your cells divide, there are errors in our genome. And the virus that causes COVID-19 already has thousands of these mutations. And you can see these mutations in websites like nextstrain.org. These are all open to public. And these are databases that are funded to track mutations and spreading. When, uh, when mutations happen, when DNA or RNA sequences replicate, there will often be errors. And these errors sometimes cannot be eliminated. And it's because of these errors that mutations exist. If you look at websites like nexttrain.org, here are the tens of thousands of SARS-CoV-2 mutations all over the globe. Uh, this is a global map. And this is a phylogenetic tree. Every single dot here is representing a cluster of different mutations, not even single mutations, but clusters. So there are that many more mutations. And here on this line are, is the entire sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it's showing you the peaks where the majority of mutations are observed. And on the bottom is the frequencies colored by clade of the different variants that are emerging. And as you know now, there are certain variants that are emerging in the UK and in South Africa that are of concern. So let's talk about this. Why are these mutations of concern? Uh, again, here is a headline from the Daily Mirror, and it says, Mutant Virus Fears, the Sick Man of Europe and the borders closing, et cetera, et cetera. So now um, what I'm gonna try to do, my friends, is rather than sensation and drama, I'm gonna try to explain the mutations in just the remaining minutes, and then I'll take questions. And then uh, I wanna tell you what, what did scientists find and what does it mean? So uh, in March in the UK, the government established what's called the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. Uh, this had a budget of $20 million, and to date, they have sequenced at least 150,000 SARS-CoV-2 sequences. This is significant because this, types of, this type of investment allows scientists to track these sequences and to see what is happening and how it's happening. All right, and then, uh, they also saw about at least 3,000 or so mutations in this pool of uh, total sequences they looked at. And what they noticed, they noticed two things. Number one, they noticed that a mutation cluster was increasing in frequency over time. And this is shown in orange, increasing over time compared to the other variants shown in blue. Number two, they saw that there were certain kinds of mutations. And this whole cluster, this is from the UK. The UK mutation cluster is known as B117 or variant of concern, 2020, 12 for December and the first variant of concern. There are 23 mutations in total and 17 of them change the protein sequence and six of them don't. Um, you may remember from biology lessons that some mutations uh, change the protein sequence, some mutations don't. All right, so then what, what did they see? Uh, there are possible hypotheses that explain this. One hypothesis is that the mutations are causing increased transmission. The other hypothesis is that other factors like super spreaders or behavior are causing increased frequency, or there's a combination of these two or perhaps other factors that are causing this. So let's break it down. When we look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, here is that list of mutations. And this figure from New York Times very nicely shows the spike protein in red shown here in the genome and all the mutations, for example, in the spike protein that are lined up here, as well as the other proteins. And some of these mutations are important because when the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to the cell to the ACE2 receptor, 
some of the mutations are at this binding site, right at this interface. And when you look at the molecular structures on the right, you can actually see the protein-protein interactions and all these different types of amino acids that are key to this interaction. And that amino acid sequence shown here is lined up here with amino acids for both SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV. Uh, the other thing that's important about these mutations is the antibodies that may develop either from a vaccine or from co uh, convalescent plasma, which is if somebody has received uh, this uh, disease and has recovered and they have antibodies, uh, they uh, th these mutations may escape some of these antibodies. So these are the concerns. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the data. When the UK COVID-19 consortium looked at the entire uh, mutations list, they noticed that these key mutations were priority mutations at, and that needs to be follow up. And it turns out that in the UK cluster, some of these mutations are indeed present uh, and they're shown here with these letters. I'm not gonna get into the details, but just, just so you know that there are scientists who have been studying these mutations in the lab for uh, years or at least for COVID-19 for months. And this consortium is now able to identify which of those should be tracked in the population in case something arises. All right, and finally, a committee called the Nerve Tag with, with several scientists came together. And in summary, they said that uh, there's high confidence that this variant of concern, or at the time known as variant under investigation, demonstrates a substantial increase in transmissibility compared to other variants. So, uh, but, so here are the three data points that suggest the increased transmission of these variants. Number one, uh, there is rapid increase in frequency compared to other variants. This is in the population. I showed you the graph already where over time, this variant is increasing in frequency compared to the other variants. Number two, the, there is an increase in the R0 value. R0 value is a value that virologists and scientists use to see how fast uh, a disease or an infection is spreading. And they basically saw that there are uh, more secondary cases here that are emerging as a result of this as calculated by epidemiologists. And number three is when they look at samples in, in nose swabs or other swabs, they identify increased viral loads in people. So these three uh, data points, my friends, have given scientists cause for concern to at least be precautious, not panic, but to be precautious and just to make sure that if we can, we can slow down the spread of these variants. And these variants are not only from the UK, so the UK cluster is B117, but also from South Africa, there's a different cluster known as B1351. And this cluster has some of the same mutations, but also different mutations. And specifically the mutation E484K is um, highlighting some concern in the South African uh, cluster. And on the right is an image of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein bind, uh, binding or interacting with the ACE2 receptor. And this image is highlighting where these mutations have been seen in humans, as well as in some of the mink studies. You may have, I'm sorry, not studies, but mink infections. You may have heard of the mink farms that are getting coronavirus infections. And I just wanted to highlight that some of these have been seen over there as well. All right, um, so what do we don't yet know? We don't yet know if the mutations are directly a cause of this uh, spread. It's likely, but we don't actually have the official data yet, but epidemiologically, that seems to be the case. Number two, we don't yet know if it affects the age group. Neil Ferguson from that nerve tag committee said children's may be key here in helping the spread. I haven't seen the data yet. It's possible that it's infecting children's better and therefore it's spreading better. Uh, that's the hypothesis. Is it more serious or more deadly? Probably not. There's no data to suggest it is. So uh, we don't think that it is more serious or more deadly. Its seriousness comes from the fact that it simply can spread much easier. Uh, will it escape vaccines? This is unlikely because vaccines trigger a very diverse immune profile, polyclonal immune responses, antibody responses, as well as cellular responses. And for that reason, uh, it's unlikely that it will escape vaccines. Even if it did, 
as I showed you earlier, with mRNA vaccines, it will be very easy for us to update the existing vaccine so that we would all get vaccinated perhaps, who knows, maybe three years down the road again, or five years, we don't know, it's hard to predict. Uh, we don't know where these mutations originated from. Uh, yes, we talk about the UK or South African cluster, but we only know as much as we look. And as I mentioned, the, the UK government invested in doing these mass screenings, and these mass screenings are not present in every country. It's not even present in the USA uh, to that degree. So for this reason, these mutations could have originated anywhere. They could have originated in, in, in the US, in Turkey. Although now we know from data, from the data, which is 0.6, now we know which countries it's in. Last I checked, it's in 39 countries, at least the UK cluster is, and at least we can tell it probably did originate from the UK because it's predominantly there, but it's less so in the other countries it's spreading, suggesting a spread. And my last slide, my friends, let's not forget that what we're encountering here with the mutations is evolution in action because all creatures evolve, including humans and viruses. We are all the results of millions of years of evolution and our ancestors. And for evolution to happen, there has to be selective pressure and adaptation. Just because you have mutations doesn't mean a virus is evolving. There has to be selective pressure. For example, the virus spreading faster or the virus escaping immune responses. And there has to be adaptation, meaning these mutations have to get fixed. All right, my friends, that's the end of my summary. I wanna thank you for your time. You can find me on social media under the moniker of Virus Phantom, Phantom with an F. I'm active on Twitter, Instagram, and I have videos on YouTube. My posts uh, are in English and in Turkish. If you see them in Turkish, don't be discouraged. Uh, you can use the translate functions, but I have English videos on YouTube as well. And once again, just to remind everyone that this presentation was brought to you by, um, this presentation was brought to you by uh, the Turkish American Cultural Association of Washington. They reached out to me and asked if I would do this. And they, uh, thanks to them, they advertised this on all the Turkish American Cultural Associations across the world, uh, US, as well as other associations across the world. And uh, a special thanks to my friend Bura, who uh, organized this whole event and got this whole up and running. Okay, so thank you. Uh, that was a little more than an hour, hour and 15 minutes, but we had a lot to cover. We could talk about COVID-19, the vaccines, the viruses, and the mutations. So I hope, my friends, this was helpful for you. And I'm gonna try to take questions now. If you have questions, try to add them to the chat there on YouTube. And since this is a live show, but this will also be recorded. So you can watch this entire show for the same link. And the same link will be present on this channel. And uh, thank you to all of you. So if, if you posted any questions, if you don't mind rewriting them, because uh, I'll have to scroll through the uh, chat list, and then I just wanna make sure. And I'm getting a lot of comments. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm so glad it was helpful. I'm getting a lot of Turkish comments saying that they understood it as if it was in Turkish. Thank you so much. I'm having uh, people and kind friends saying hello from Germany. I'm having friends saying hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It's so good to see all of you. Thank you for joining. And OK, I'm looking through questions. Here's one question. Um, one question is, what's the difference between the DNA vaccine and the mRNA vaccine? So these both are nucleic acid vaccines, meaning your goal is to try to deliver the viral sequence uh, into the cells in the form of a vaccine. And that sequence is going to encode the protein and that protein will trigger an immune response. And this is going to allow uh, you to basically be protected, hopefully, uh, with, this with this vaccine. So now, um, the difference between DNA and, and mRNA, of course, there are uh, biological and structural differences that I won't get into. But instead, uh, what I want to talk about is DNA, uh, will enter the cell, but for DNA to work, it has to enter the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, it doesn't integrate into your genome because it doesn't have the machinery to integrate. Um, however, it exists as an episome. Episome means it exists as a circle outside of your genome, but in the, in the uh, nucleus. And then from there, it will produce 
mRNA, and that mRNA will migrate to the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm, it will produce proteins. Whereas in the RNA vaccine, there's no nuclear life cycle. Uh, the vaccine RNA moiety exists in the cytoplasm. It doesn't enter the nucleus. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Let's see if there are any other comments. Uh, we have some friends from the UK. Hello, my friends in UK. I hope you're safe. I hope you're dealing with tier five well. I know that's a pain in the ass, and I'm very sorry. Where I live, uh, we also have some pretty serious restrictions as well. Okay, uh, I'm scrolling for more questions. Um, if there are no more questions, we can end this, but I want to make sure. Okay, so here is a question. Why did the gov German government buy different brand vaccines? I actually don't know the answer to this. I don't know what vaccine brands the German government bought. Um, I'm sure this is as simple as Googling it. Why did they choose to purchase those vaccines? I have no idea. Uh, governments make plenty of decisions and so on and so forth. Okay, we have another question about the Chinese Sinovac vaccine. This is especially important for our friends in Turkey, in Brazil, in Indonesia, as well as in China, because that's where these vaccines are going to be uh, hopefully used. Uh, what do we think about the effectiveness? So unfortunately, Sinovac has not yet published their data. We are desperately waiting. All we are hearing about is anecdotal data being presented here and there. The last I heard is that in Turkey, because Turkey was part of the clinical trials for Sinovac, uh, in about not a lot of patients, uh, sorry, not, not in a lot of volunteers during the clinical trials, uh, just in a few, uh, but uh, they calculated it to be about 91.25% efficacious. It's a really good value, but it's based on uh, only 29 COVID-19 cases. So 29 cases, 26 of them were in the placebo, only three were in the vaccine. Uh, this hasn't been published, but has only been uh, mentioned by the Turkish government. Uh, so we hope that holds. Brazil mentioned that uh, the, in their studies, they saw 78%. Unfortunately, I cannot warrant any of these numbers except wait for Sinovac to publish its data. It's really unfortunate because at a time when Pfizer, Moderna, BioNTech, AstraZeneca have been desperately publishing their findings and being very transparent with their data, it's really sad to see that Sinovac um, is, we, we don't have the data yet. Uh, I, I'm not blaming them for anything. It's simply possible that they're compiling the data and they were waiting for enough cases. So it's just a matter of waiting. I hope that's sufficient, but everything so far suggests that yes, the Sinovac vaccine is also effective and will help. Uh, all right, and we are looking at some friends here. We have some friends who have received the vaccine. Congratulations. I'm so glad you had no complications and I'm very happy for you. One, one by one, I'm seeing my colleagues, my friends get vaccinated. I haven't gotten vaccinated yet because uh, I don't fit the description of the first tier of vaccinations. So I am waiting and uh, I can't wait. All right, so, so this is an important question. So thank you for asking this. This question is about UK's decision to delay the second dose by 12 weeks. So here's, here's what's happening. Uh, some governments are saying, instead of uh, following the recommended three-week dosing scheme, so you get the vaccine and then three weeks later you get the second vaccine, instead of that, uh, let's, let's make sure that we can vaccinate more people so that the first dose will be given to a lot more people and people who get the first dose will wait longer to get their second dose. So they're gonna get it in 12 weeks instead of three. Uh, and the US is considering this, some other countries are, and there's a big debate. And the debate, as you can imagine, is yes, we should, no, we shouldn't. And let me explain why. People who think, yes, we should delay the second dose, they're thinking that even though the first dose is not as efficacious as for a vaccine, uh, the fact that we vaccinated twice as many people is going to go farther in helping curb this pandemic. And then the people who think we shouldn't do this, uh, they are saying that, no, the clinical trials were only done with a three-week interval, and we have no idea how protective the single dose is. Uh, there's some data to suggest it might be, but it's not uh, you know, real data that you can stand behind. And for that reason, they're saying we cannot put our healthcare workers 
our elderly, our nursing homes in risk by giving them only one dose? Because the one dose also gives us a false sense of security. So my personal thoughts is I am leaning more towards trying to do this in the approved regimen of three weeks. If it was approved for three weeks, everyone gets their dose during that three week time. Um, I hope I'm wrong uh, because uh, that I would rather that we just curb this. All we want is we just want to curb this pandemic as fast as possible. So I can you know, fly to Turkey and meet up with my friends. I can fly to UK, fly to Germany, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So, uh, all right, I hope that was helpful. Uh, let's look at another question. Uh, given the current lack of data with vaccine and pregnancies, what would be the potential concerns for pregnant women taking it? This is an important question. So um, in the clinical trials, we only know what demographics were in the trial as participants. And as you can imagine, uh, there probably were not that many pregnant women. Uh, yes, Pfizer reported their, the number of pregnant women in their studies, and uh, they basically, you know, uh, there's just that not not that many to know if it if it if it caused any problems. The good news is so far there is no data to suggest it's of any risk to pregnant women. And uh, I have some healthcare worker friends. Uh, I also know of uh, some acquaintances or people I do not know but who are pregnant and who uh, chose to get the vaccine. Why? Because they um, had to gauge the risk benefit. Uh, if you are a healthcare worker, if you are a teacher, if you are in a nursing home, uh, if you are in a high-risk COVID population, uh, there is some unfortunate data that says pregnant people are more vulnerable to COVID-19, um, not just infections, but also complications. And for this matter, um, what I recommend, I'm not a physician and I can't recommend anyone to get a vaccine or not get a vaccine. What I recommend you do, my friends, is you talk to your physician and uh, talk to your healthcare providers and see if you are in this demographic that should get vaccinated even though you're pregnant because, again, it's a risk benefit. Uh, scientifically, there's practically no risk, uh, no, no significant risk that, that I can think of that would cause any problems here. But again, there's only the data and we can only think about the data. Uh, okay, here's another question. Is it true that the DNA is altered by some of the vaccines and what does this mean? Uh, so on social media, so let, let, let me say this, uh, this COVID-19 is the first social media pandemic. Uh, we The previous pandemic was the 2009 flu pandemic, and we didn't really have social media at that time. I mean, we did, but like people had MySpace, some people had Facebook and so on and so forth. But uh, we didn't really have this much rumor and information spreading. Uh, this is a good thing and bad thing. The good thing is uh, I can do shows like this and we can all learn from each other. We can learn the science. Um, there are all these amazing scientists out there on Twitter. I'm not saying this for myself, but for others who are sharing amazing science about uh, COVID-19 vaccines, etc., and all of us are learning from them. That's the good. Uh, also, I get to meet amazing people, and that's the good on social media. The bad is uh, there are that much, if not more, uh, conspiracy theories, false information, etc., being spread as well. Uh, as a scientist, I am trained to look only at data, and I am tra to, trained to interpret data, and I'm trained to uh, build experiments with hypotheses and data. So coming to your question, Yas, I mean, here's, here's where we stand. Uh, no, there is no truth to the statements that the DNA, that our DNA is altered by these vaccines. Let me give you an example. In these mRNA vaccines, the mRNA is cytoplasmic. It doesn't integrate uh, into the nucleus, and therefore it doesn't pose a risk to the uh, genome. Uh, let's talk about DNA vaccines or viral vector vaccines. Viral vector vaccines, yes, they do cross the nucleus and they exist episomally. The adenoviral vectors do not have the biology to integrate into the host genome. Now, does that mean there will absolutely be zero integrations uh, for forever? No, because guess what? Uh, in this presentation, I talked about viral sequences that have integrated into our genome. This doesn't apply to the vaccines. No, it doesn't, but there are mechanisms. Uh, I'm getting really into the weeds here, just to be completely thorough. Uh, there are mechanisms, you can Google this, they're called non-homologous end joining 
or they're called non-homologous recombination. And accidentally, sometimes genomes can take in sequences from their environments. This can happen with uh, viruses. Forget vaccines. Every time you get infected with the flu, with uh, adenovirus, the common cold viruses, rhinovirus, every time, and every year we get infected with these viruses. And every single time you are being exposed to the DNA or the RNA of that virus. So compared to this entire sea of exposure to viral sequences, what you're getting with the vaccine is nothing compared to this C. So to answer your question, uh, no, your DNA will not be altered, my friend. So do not worry. All right. Um, I think uh, that might be, uh, okay, let's, there's one more question here. Let's talk about this. Can this illness turn to seasonal after mutations and can the vaccines re effects be reduced uh, like the seasonal flu? So let's talk about this. Um, first of all, uh, viruses uh, often will be selected to uh, spread better or to lose their infectivity. And uh, as long as a virus is successfully spreading, there is no reason for it to uh, stop spreading or no reason for it to slow down. It's successfully spreading. Why should it stop? Uh, similarly, uh, the virus here is not causing disease or serious disease. So there's no, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, it is causing serious disease, but not compared to MERS or SARS. SAR, MERS and SARS were much more serious in terms of their deadliness. And for that reason, they couldn't spread as fast. Here in COVID-19, it spreads very fast, but it's not as deadly. But the combination of that still creates a very serious COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, uh, almost 2 million deaths now uh, worldwide. And so for this reason, uh, this, there's really no selective pressure on this virus to mutate and to weaken. Now, over time, and by over time, I'm not saying three, five years, over time, hundreds of years, over hundreds of years, it is possible that this virus, SARS-CoV-2, will still circulate among humans. Uh, in fact, I believe it will. I believe it will be the fifth uh, human coronavirus that circulates around the globe. Uh, and thanks to vaccines, uh, we will be safe from it. And we will uh, be, uh, I'm not saying protected from it, but I'm saying we won't have the symptoms because we don't yet know if the vaccine prevents spread. What we do know is that it prevents symptoms, COVID-19 symptoms and cases. So, all right. Um, so that's the mutation. So no, I don't think this is gonna turn into a seasonal flu-like virus anytime soon. It's May, but after a long, long, long time. And then can the virus, uh, can the vaccine efficacy be reduced? It's possible. Um, however, this is no cause for concern because I mentioned earlier that uh, vaccines produced very diverse immune responses. And also there are, there's not one, but there are many kinds of uh, vaccines today. If it just so happens that one vaccine starts losing efficacy, there are other vaccines that are gonna be available and it's possible that's gonna uh, solve any of these problems. Uh, thank you for that question. All right, um, there's another question here. Let's see, are, are there concerns about an individual, uh, infected individual receiving the vaccine and the actual virus obtains the advantage of the modified synthetic protein changes to make the cell wall more, per more permanent? This is a good question. The shorter answer is no, this risk doesn't exist. Uh, and and let, let's talk about it a little bit. So um, if you are infected uh, while you receive this vaccine or vice versa, if you get vaccinated, but you get infected soon thereafter and the vaccine hasn't worked its immunity yet, uh, will there be possible recombination between your sequence and this uh, vaccine sequence? That's highly unlikely. Uh, because it's a timing thing. For example, these RNA vaccines, these mRNA vaccines exist in your cell for a very short amount of time, just a matter of days. And first of all, what are the odds of those cells having a virus at the same time in those days? Number two, you're getting vaccinated in your deltoid muscle. So the vaccine sequences are in your deltoid muscle and antigen presenting cells. Whereas uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 infections, are in your upper respiratory and in your lower respiratory tract. So for that reason, my friend, it makes it 
highly, highly unlikely that uh, the vaccine and the virus would ever cross paths in the same cell. And even if it did, uh, there isn't any biological explanation for there to be uh, something to be created like this. And I hope that was helpful. All right. Okay, my friends, I think that is the end of the, qu end of the response uh, questions. Uh, oh, oh, here's a question. Let's talk about this. What happens if the vaccine is injected subcutaneously instead of intramuscularly? Um, I don't know uh, the answer to this question. Uh, however, all the clinical trials were done intramuscularly, and we know from that vaccinology that intramuscular injections, at least in this case, work really well. It's possible not for COVID-19, but it's possible for other mRNA vaccine technologies, subcutaneous infection, uh, in injections of the vaccine may be better. All right, my friends, thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, this completes the one and a half hour. Uh, I tried to give you a presentation about COVID-19, the, vac the virus, the va vaccine, the mutations. Um, this video is gonna be available uh, on the same link uh, on this channel. And once again, my name is Semi Tarin, and uh, I bid you farewell, and I hope you stay healthy. And uh, I, I hope all of us can get to meet face to face one day, we can have a beer or two and uh, talk about and reminisce about the pandemic. And uh, I hope that this pandemic will be over as fast and as soon as possible. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for your time and attention.